Where does Halo belong in terms of traditional science fiction? You know, it's somewhere between hard science fiction and space opera. It has this wonderful sense of drama to it. It's humans with their back against the wall fighting for their lives. What began as a video game has grown into a sweeping multi-layered sci-fi epic, complete with books, graphic novels, and films. A meticulously constructed saga defined by compelling characters, gripping storylines, and richly detailed worlds and cultures. Halo the game begins more than 500 years in the future. Humans have discovered faster than light travel and are colonizing the Milky Way. In the process, they encounter a hostile alliance of aliens known as the Covenant. Motivated by promises of eternal paradise, the Covenant views humanity as an affront to their gods and have vowed to eliminate them. Halo's central figure is Master Chief John 117 a genetically enhanced, cybernetically augmented soldier in the United Nations Space Command. His revolutionary Spartan Mjolnir armor is equipped with an artificial intelligence program known as Cortana. When we first meet Master Chief, the war with the Covenant has already raged for 30 years. Escaping from a disastrous battle, the Master Chief's escape pod crashes in a mysterious ring world, a superstructure orbiting a remote gas giant. This halo is a relic from a technologically advanced race known as the Foreigners, who mysteriously vanished some 100,000 years ago. As the Master Chief battles with pursuing Covenant troops, a parasitic entity known as the Flood is accidentally unleashed on the halo. The Flood feeds on sentient life forms and seems to hold a clue to the Foreigners' mysterious disappearance long ago. Hundreds of thousands of years ago, the Forerunners were the most technologically advanced race in the Milky Way. With unparalleled technology, they explored the entire galaxy. They used their profound wisdom and understanding to protect and guide the many life forms they encountered. And then came the Flood. The Flood is this parasitic organism that attaches to uh, 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 creatures with large brain matter, takes them over, uses their biological material to create more flood spores, and off you go. It's a it's a terrible parasitic uh, cataclysm. On a metaphorical level, they're the, the bug-eyed monsters. They're the, the thing under the bed. They're the, the id. For 300 years, the Forerunners tried unsuccessfully to eliminate the Flood. Then suddenly, some 100,000 years ago, both races mysteriously disappeared. Even though relics of the Forerunners' powerful technology remain scattered throughout the galaxy, no one knows what became of them. With the Forerunners gone, two alien species, the Prophets and the Elites, first discovered each other in their search for artifacts. Shortly after this encounter, their races collided in a battle to control the technology that was left behind. Both the Prophets and the Elites saw the Forerunners as gods, believing that they ascended to a state of divinity. The Prophets, physically inferior, wanted to exploit Forerunner technology and follow them on the Great Journey, an equivalent of godhood. The elites, proud, strong warriors, considered use of this technology to be sacrilege. This dispute sparked a war. Eventually, the prophets and the elites form a truce, an unsteady alliance that becomes known as the Covenant. The prophets agree to share foreigner technology. The elites agree to defend the prophet's search for the sacred rings, the halos. They revere the forerunner as the creators of technology and a lot of the, the, the cohesion that holds their collection of races together. As the Covenant moves through the galaxy, they encounter and enslave many alien races. These races include hunters, a worm-like species that group together into a communal armor-plated form. Drones, flying insect-like warriors that serve as infantry. Jackals are employed mainly as scouts due to their excellent vision and dexterity. And the Brutes, a warlike race with great strength and stamina. And of course, Grunts, the Covenant's cannon fodder, plentiful and strong, but also clumsy and occasionally cowardly. The Covenant has always struck me as kind of a, a weird collection of races. Uh, they seem to waltz in and conquer races and make them part of their own collective, you know, like communism marching across East, Eastern Europe. But they're, they're all weird and they don't fit together well. It is a powerful empire with prophets and elites at the top, ruling jointly through a high council. That council's most prominent officials during the Halo event are the Prophet of Truth, the Prophet of Mercy, and the Prophet of Regret. 
On Earth, overpopulation and dwindling resources force humans to look to other planets. It's a prospect made much more accessible with slipstream space travel in the year 2291, after the development of humankind's own translight engine technology. While inferior to the foreigners faster than light travel, this technology nonetheless gives humans the means to aggressively colonize the galaxy. It was wonderful. They sent their best and brightest out to those colonies. They started really receiving all these wonderful you know, luxury goods and food. I mean, you can imagine a planet that had 18 hours of sunlight a day and had these wonderful alluvial volcanic plains where you could grow uh, uh, crops with 10 times, 20 times the yield. So why not put all our farms on a distant world like harvest? So it was a great time of economic prosperity, and of course it didn't last. To deal with growing planetary conflicts, the United Nations Space Command is formed, becoming Earth's primary military force. By 2390, 210 worlds are occupied by humans. These are known as the Inner Colonies. Within 100 years, the Interstellar Empire grows to over 800 planets. So once they started going out further and further into space, into what was called historically later the Outer Colonies, they no longer had the best and brightest to send out. And as things got further and further away from Earth, the ideologies of those, those colonies changed a little bit and they were further removed from Earth, almost like the American colonies were removed from the British Commonwealth. The inner colonies, closer to Earth, are more developed and politically stable. The outer colonies are responsible for providing raw materials to those inner colonies. This leads to friction and frequently open rebellion, compelling the UNSC to establish headquarters on a planet known as Reach, and Reach becomes humanity's most heavily fortified world. An insurgency started up, and that was actually the, the reason the Spartan program, Spartan II program, was initiated to counter the insurgency uh, of the outer colonies. Because you can imagine, if you're on Earth, and you have the inner colonies, and you have this unrest in all these outer colonies, my God, you're surrounded, you're literally surrounded by a potential enemy that may even outnumber you. The, the psychology of that, that situation must have been fascinating for the people who were making decisions on Earth. Well, anyway, you know, as things happened, there were, there were encounters and there was a military buildup between the, the, the inner worlds and the, the outer colonies. Uh, Spark II program came online, and that's when the Covenant uh, first found harvest and the conflict with the Covenant began. Uh, and it's just a remarkably good thing that we had that insurgency ahead of time, or the Covenant just would have waltzed in completely unopposed because we wouldn't have had, a, we wouldn't have had the Spartans, would have had an adequate military. And of course, that's when the, begin, the games uh, begin really at the height of that conflict. In 2491, the Office of Naval Intelligence initiates the Orion Project. Its goal, produce counterinsurgency squads of super soldiers by subjecting volunteers to risky genetic enhancements. Unfortunately, those who don't die develop severe mental problems. As a result, the Orion project is quietly shelved. By 2517, the security situation in the outer planets is dire, and well-organized groups such as the United Rebel Front threaten the stability of all the colonies. Using data from Orion, Dr. Catherine Elizabeth Halsey launches the Spartan II project. Spartans are kidnapped as children at the age of, you know, roughly six. Uh, taken away from their parents uh, and inducted into this world of violence and a regimen of discipline and, and real horror. Only 33 subjects make it to active duty in the year 2525. These walking weapons of war are stronger, faster, and smarter than normal soldiers. Each of these Spartans wears special Mjolnir assault armor. Advanced piece of engineering costs as much as a, a UNSC destroyer probably harder to make, too. It's a series of strength multiplying and redactive circuits that multiply strength and speed. It really is a, a terrible thing that Halsey came up with in response to an insurgency. Rather than diplomatic solutions or conventional military solutions, they came up with this. And, and this specifically was, in order to indoctrinate the biological inserts into the Molnir armor, they needed to do that at a very early age. So they screened the population for the right DNA and they, they were stealing children. They were stealing five and six-year-old kids. They were flash cloning replacements uh, who would then not do so well in, in, you know, in the families they were replaced in. They were almost made to, to fail because the flash cloning technology at the time wasn't so great. They would take these kids, they would indoctrinate them into the military, train the heck out of them. 
It'll make ranger school look like, you know, a picnic. Uh, then when they reach puberty, they would actually uh, uh, bio biochemically and biomechanically manipulate their bodies uh, with almost a 50-50 failure rate. When I say failure, I mean, some of those, those kids would die, some of them would be, you know, uh, hideously malformed afterwards, but those that survived had, you know, incredible bone density, incredible muscle density, uh, uh, you know, higher chemical response times in their myelin sheaths, so they're better, faster, stronger, with all this military training. The armor is also capable of housing a smart AI, an artificial intelligence free of restrictive programming, allowing it to learn and grow intellectually and to develop its own distinct personality. In 2525, UNSC communication with the outer colony planet known as Harvest goes dark. UNSC scout ships sent to investigate find the planet completely incinerated. Its surface melted down to glass. This form of destruction becomes known as glassing. Uh, when the Covenant come in and glass a planet, they use a, a combination of Sha, uh, Fujikawa uh, slip space manipulation and plasma to heat the, pla the surface of the, the planet until it vaporizes the atmosphere, the oceans, and leaves a glassy crust. Um, depending on the planet and the technology and the amount of ships, it could take a few days, but then you got nothing alive left. It's really a horrific ultimate weapon to destroying an Earth colony. Orbiting the remains of Harvest is a single alien ship. It quickly attacks the fleet, destroying all ships but one. The remaining ship receives this mysterious message. Your destruction is the will of the gods, and we are their instrument. The enemy is identified as the Covenant. Their interstellar religious quest led them to Harvest, where Forerunner technology had identified a large reliquary of artifacts. As it turned out, these artifacts were actually the human colony itself. This leads the Covenant to conclude the humans are somehow connected to the Forerunners, a contradiction of their religious doctrine. The basic beef that the Covenant have with the humans is they are, have access to and are using Forerunner technology, which they view as sacred and uh, uh, holy, and the humans aren't supposed to have access to it. Uh, they do and they use it, and for many uh, religious and political reasons on the Covenant side, that really irritates them. So uh, they have vowed in the Covenant War to eradicate them, the humans. Thus begins the Human Covenant War. By 2535, the Covenant has captured and glassed almost all of the outer colonies. They then turn their attention to the inner colonies. As the battle moves closer to Earth, mankind unites against the Covenant threat. As the Covenant really weren't used to seeing anything, you know, quite as well trained or determined or well coordinated in their enemies before. For years, the humans win isolated battles, but at a terrible cost. Desperate, the UNSC initiates the Spartan III program, this time using revenge-motivated orphans of war. Let's face it, the Spartan IIs were extraordinarily effective against the, the, the Covenant. They could infiltrate, they could kill the Covenant like no other soldier in, in the UNSC uh, um, uh, military apparatus, but they were extraordinarily expensive to make, to train. It took, uh, you know, a lot of time, a lot of resources. The armor was up. Each suit of Molnir armor costs as, as much as a small starship. So uh, the UNSC military wanted more of that, but they wanted it cheaper, faster, just like, just like anything in the military. If it's good, they will reproduce it and make it cheaper and faster and, and maybe not as good. But that's what the Spartan 3s were. They're kind of like Spartan 2s, but on the cheap. Uh, they were, it, they were a, a top secret uh, military program because they were also considered disposable. They were sent on the, the high-risk suicide missions. Other special forces include the ODST, Orbital Drop Shock Troops, known as Helljumpers for their daring high-altitude deployment into combat zones. They're really the elite fighting units. They, they pull a lot of weight in the, in the war. They're, you know, the special ops guys. They drop in, feet first into hell. It takes a lot of guts to be a, an ODST. Maybe you're a little crazy, too. The ODSTs resent the Spartans. Uh, they think that Spartans are spoiled, that they get all the best equipment, and uh, the beauty of that rivalry is completely one-sided. The Spartans don't care about the ODSTs at all, really. They just care about the job at hand. It's 2552. The Covenant have destroyed much of the inner colonies. Mankind faces imminent extinction. In a desperate move, a secret UNSC task force is assembled to capture a Covenant ship. 
The task force is led by Master Chief John 117, on board a specially outfitted ship known as the Pillar of Autumn. He is the best leader. I, I think he has the best strategic and tactical vision of any of the Spartans. He knows how to put a group together and use them better than almost anyone. The uh, aliens from the Covenant describe him as a demon, and he really has this kind of Greek mythology type feel about him. You know, all the Marines and the ODST drop soldiers are all kind of in awe of him and what he is, and he's also sort of the last of his kind. The UNSC plan, however, is ruined when the Covenant launch a surprise attack on the fortress world of Reach. During the ensuing battle, Reach is overrun, and the human fleet destroyed. Believing that all other Spartans have been killed on the surface of the planet, the Master Chief escapes with the Pillar of Autumn. The ship makes a blind slip space jump and emerges near a mysterious ring world, the superstructure known as Halo. And this is where the Halo saga begins. Cortana, the artificial intelligence found within the Master Chief's Mjolnir armor, was created from the cloned brain of Spartan 2 project designer, Dr. Catherine Halsey. Cortana is what's called a smart AI, as opposed to a dumb AI. In the early UNSC, they had dumb AIs that were experts in their field. Uh, you know, tactical urban combat or spaceship flight. A smart AI is a different beast entirely. They have a limited lifespan uh, of about seven years, but they're brilliant. They're far more brilliant than any other standard AI and hundreds of times more brilliant and creative than any human mind. Uh, at the height of their powers. But literally, they grow so large and intricate, and all the interconnections within the, the neural AI matrix, they literally think themselves into oblivion with too many connections, too much power. Uh, and uh, there has been speculation that uh, towards the end of that cycle, they may even go insane. The halo structure where the Master Chief lands is vast. It has its own atmosphere, and it can support life. The Covenant believes that the seven halo rings, which were previously undiscovered, mark the start of the Foreigner's great journey, their ascent into godhood. During the Master Chief's time on Halo, however, the long dormant flood is inadvertently released from a containment facility. An eccentric AI named 343 Guilty Spark identifies Master Chief as a reclaimer, someone capable of activating the ring's weapon system in order to destroy the flood. Guilty Spark also reveals the terrifying truth behind Halo, Installation 04, as he calls it. These rings are actually doomsday weapons, designed by the foreigners to destroy the flood. It is a weapon, and it's used to generate this horrific pulse of energy that goes at a speed faster than light throughout the galaxy and kills sentient life of a th certain threshold, designed initially to deprive the flood of its food source. Long ago, in a last ditch effort to stop the flood, the foreigners activated the halo array. The release of the alien parasite on Halo by the Covenant later required to be activated once again, an act which can only stop the flood outbreak by wiping out all sentient life and starving the parasite of its essential food source. The Master Chief averts a galactic holocaust by detonating the fusion reactors on the crippled Pillar of Autumn and destroying the Halo installation, the flood parasite, and an entire Covenant armada. Following his defeat at Halo Installation 04, Supreme Commander within the Covenant, an elite known as Thel Vadame, is stripped of his high rank, publicly tortured, and sentenced to death by his own High Council. But the Prophet of Truth overrules the Council, giving Thel the chance to redeem his honor by becoming an Arbiter, an ancient tradition in which disgraced elites embark on suicide missions. Meanwhile, the Covenant locate Earth, but due to a miscommunication, an attack force led by the Prophet of Regret is defeated in a brief but violent battle. The Prophet of Regret manages to escape through slip space to Halo Installation 05, which his forces eventually activate. The Master Chief is able to follow the Covenant ship through slip space with UNSC forces. There, they prevent the Halo ring from firing and kill the Prophet of Regret. This act once again prevents galactic destruction at the hands of Halo, but not without cost. The ring's activation has put all remaining installations on standby, ready to be fired from a location known as the Ark. Throughout the Covenant Alliance, word spreads about the true purpose of the Halo Array and the link between mankind and the Forerunners. The Prophet of Truth uses Regret's death as an excuse to reorder Covenant society, forcing out the elites and bringing in the more loyal and controllable brutes. 
they launch a genocidal campaign against the elites, sparking a civil war. Surprising alliances develop. The elites, led by the Arbiter, ally with their former enemies, the humans. Even the Flood, embodied as the centralized intelligence known as the Gravemind, allies with the Master Chief and the Arbiter to prevent the Halo Array from firing. These disparate species join together to thwart a common enemy before dealing with each other. The Covenant, led by the Prophet of Truth, throws its full might into an invasion of Earth. They are entirely focused on securing an enormous forerunner structure recently unearthed beneath the sands of Africa. Earth's forces are decimated, their fleet almost completely destroyed. The entire human population is reduced to a mere 200 million people. With the return of Master Chief, the UNSC mounts a last-ditch assault at the heart of the excavated forerunner relic, which is soon revealed to be an ancient space portal. This gateway leads to the Ark, the failsafe installation hidden outside the Milky Way galaxy. The Prophet of Truth and the remainder of the Covenant managed to escape using this portal. Amid the chaos, a flood-infected ship crashes on Earth and causes a mass outbreak. But with help from elite separatists, the parasite menace is contained. Cortana, who has been captured by the Flood's grave mind, leaves a message for the Master Chief. A plan for stopping the Flood is at the other end of the portal. The UNSC and elite forces send a small fleet through the Forerunner portal. Once through, they learn that the Ark is maintained and protected by a variety of AI systems. These also serve as a data bank, housing information on what the Forerunners faced when they activated the Halo Array long ago. The facility also has the ability to build brand new Halo installations, and it has nearly completed construction of the replacement for Installation 04, the one which Master Chief destroyed several months earlier. The Ark becomes the site of the final showdown between the UNSC and Elite Alliance and the remnants of the Covenant, led by the Prophet of Truth. Against all odds, mankind prevails, defeating the Covenant, killing the Prophet of Truth, and destroying the Flood. A formal peace agreement is forged between humanity and the elites. Whatever remained of the Covenant is seemingly disbanded. Months later, in 2553, a monument is erected on a hillside near the Ark portal. It commemorates the billions of men and women killed during the war, and among them, Master Chief. The Arbiter attends this ceremony in honor of his fallen comrade. But is this war truly over? <laughs>